here. As recently as the 1920s, scientists viewed bacteria, the study of bacteria as one which was uh, made uh, problematic by the presence of mold. Mold was a nuisance. So when Alexander Fleming went into his laboratory every day as one of the noted microbiologists, he started with the same routine. He would put his papers down on the desk, he'd put on his white lab coat, and he'd go to his lab bench where he'd look at his culture dishes that he had prepared the day before. He'd pick one up, one at a time, he'd look through them, with many of them contaminated by mold, and therefore, he would toss them in the garbage. One day, he noticed that one plate was a little bit different. He wasn't exactly sure what it was. He had looked at thousands and thousands of these culture dishes, done thousands of experiments, and yet something told him, with all that experience, that this one deserved further study. He spent the next few months researching what was going on, what happened, what was so special about this mold, and soon after published a paper where he shared his discovery of penicillin, the first antibiotic responsible for saving millions of lives over the following decades. He could do this because he had acquired the skills, combined them with the experience, and had the wisdom that enabled him to see the possibilities. Louis Pasteur knew much about this. Perhaps he was the one who set the map for us when he pointed out that chance favors the prepared mind. Fleming, at 47, had the wisdom that made him the example of a man with a prepared mind. In fact, when he accepted his Nobel Prize some years later, he recounted that his major contribution was that he had made the observation and, of course, acted upon it. Wisdom is of great value. And while this may seem very obvious, what we often forget is that it's wisdom that's earned over years, earned over a period of time with a wide variety and depth of experience that provides the greatest value. And the importance of that wisdom is that within that wisdom is where the difference makers will come. Yes, age is the advantage for those of us who want to make a difference. Now, our society, of course, doesn't believe in that. We've heard it time and time again. It celebrates our young. Many of us think of being the next Swift or Zuckerberg or Malala, people who come up with great steps, great ideas, great execution, and can even impact generations with what they do. But making a difference doesn't require just those once-in-a-lifetime kinds of observations, once-in-a-lifetime types of ideas. It's really about doing things that impact the people around you, the community around you, or perhaps more broadly. But that's not where the real value lies. That's not where we need to go. Yet, because of what our society tells us, many of us start to toil in a situation where we end up breeding regret. Regret for what could have been, regret for those opportunities that we missed. And so as regret builds, we see a pattern that parallels the overall happiness of people in society by age. For example, when you're young, if you measure regret, you don't really see much of a pattern. Some people have regrets, some don't. Certainly by the age of 30, it doesn't seem to be a very notable type of emotion. But as we age, as we start to see this disconnect between what we aspire to be and what we aspire to do, and what we're accomplishing and what we're being told we can accomplish, regret builds, peaking in the late 40s. There's that pressure, and human nature says we need to figure out a way to relieve that pressure. So we look for a source of information that tells us that we really can't accomplish. We go back to the idea that society presents that it's the young that matters. To relieve that pressure, to give up, we find those sources of information, and in fact, we give up that relieves the pressure, regret goes away, 
and we lose our opportunity and we lose our drive. The problem is that we've let ourselves believe that we can't accomplish, we can't make a difference once we hit 35, 40, or 50 because of icons such as this. Einstein was well recognized for saying that once you reach the age of 30, if you have not made your contribution, and he was speaking of science, to that field, then you are not going to. That 30 was where you had reached your peak and you were done. Yet if we look at the Nobel Prize winning ages from when he was working, the great discoveries were made by people who averaged in their mid-30s. He didn't really understand what the data showed. And as we move towards today, the average age is now reaching the mid to upper 40s. Certainly, Einstein was wrong. 30 is not the end of the road for having impact. Age is an advantage. What about Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule? We've heard that either we're going to achieve greatness, we're gonna reach our maximum potential because we've done 10,000 hours of practice, starting when we were young, or at least be pretty close to getting there, or we can't achieve greatness, we can't reach our potential. What do the data say about that? Well, there's a very important study in the early 90s that said that if you're a violin player, it does make the difference between those who are at the highest level and those who are not. But it did not prove a causal relationship. It was an association. So you look at this and you say, if I want to be a violin player and I'm starting at the age of four, yes, deliberate practice makes a difference. But perhaps there are other things. My talent, the quality of my teaching, the support I have from my family, from my parents. In fact, when you look at the entirety of the data, what you find is that in over 203 studies done on deliberate practice, that some patterns emerge that tell us that in fact, deliberate practice is not the major difference maker. Now it does make some difference. If you wanna be a violin player, it takes into account, it accounts for about a fifth of the reason for the difference between the greatest and the rest. If you want to be a Scrabble player or a chess player, it's about a quarter of the difference that it accounts for. But if you are trying to aspire in an educational field, in a professional field, the amount of difference that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice accounts for is either 4% for education or less than 1% for professions. Clearly, this is not the key factor. It's seductive. We want to believe it, but Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule has duped us because we wanted to believe, we needed to believe, but in fact, the data don't support that we should believe in Gladwell's rule. So why are they wrong? How could they be so wrong? Well, they actually didn't understand how well the human brain works as you get over 30 and even independent of 10,000 hours of practice. Now, we know that when you're young, you get smarter, as shown here, when you're old, the average, you know, you start hitting around 70, the cognitive skills start to drop off. But in between 39 and your late 60s, cognitive performance, inductive reasoning, abstract thinking, all those skills that are critical to identifying possible solutions, identifying ways to work with other people, identifying ways to implement a plan and achieve success are at their highest level and remain at their highest level. Age is an advantage. Those of us who are over 35, over 40, or even over 50 are the people who can make the difference, who have the skills to make the difference, and who must step up to make the difference. Now, how does that work out in practical terms? Well, when you look at companies that were started in between 1995 and 2005, that within the next 10 years achieved a million dollars of sales. This is a Dun & Bradstreet listing. And then survey over 500 founders in this group. You see that a fair number of them started their companies when they were young. But a whole bunch more started their companies over 35 and half were over 39 when they started their companies that were successful. In fact, there were more successful companies started by people who were in their early 50s than in their early 20s. 
Again, if you want to start a successful business, launch a product or idea to make a difference, age is an advantage. And when you're thinking about starting things, of course, most of us need funding. So if you look at what happened in 2010, we see that the angel and venture community know where the success comes from. They have the data, they have the experience. And so less than one in 20 of companies that were funded in 2010 in the internet space were started by people under 25. And if you go up to 35, it's still only a third, which means that the people who know what's the, been shown to be effective, what's shown to be successful, two-thirds of the time bet their money on people who are over 35. These are the people who have the skills, the experience, and the wisdom to be successful. Now, it's not that the young don't have advantages. There are many. One in particular that we all recognize is that great way that the young can ask questions with curiosity, without so many biases or those kinds of biases that are serving as shackles, holding them back. With age, with experience, and with wisdom, we can look at skills like that and figure out how to apply those in our daily activities and ask even better questions. Because what it boils down to is not only that age is an advantage, but with that advantage comes an obligation to act. So Fleming, at 47, made this observation about mold. I don't think he was thinking, oh, I'm over 40, I have an obligation, but he had the experience, he had the skills. He was uniquely suited to make the observation, implement a plan, and define a product that could save lives. Now, there are many examples all around you. Some of you could go back and look at your academic colleagues and see some professors and faculty who have made great accomplishments. And as you go back, you can look to those people. You can look to your peers in your community as well as your job and find many examples of people who figured out how to identify their opportunity, leveraging their skills, leveraging their experience, applying that wisdom to come to a solution. I like to tell the story of a friend, Denny Taylor, who graduated college at a time when women were really battling their roles, whether they were supposed to go into the workplace or have a conventional life at that time of raising children. She started out in the career path, dropped out of it, as she was described by her friends, to raise a family. But during that time, Dinny took a little different approach. First of all, she had taken a class in college in computer programming that she thought was really fun, very challenging. And so she committed, while she was raising her children, to taking classes part-time. Now, she used to have to look for a building like this to go to, to take her classes. We don't have that limitation anymore. She was building her skills and her experience. And at the same time, raising kids, she learned all sorts of things like project management, effective communication, influencing people who don't want to listen to you. <laughs> you can imagine how having those kinds of skills, with the ability to manage a, a software development project, enabled her to land a job very quickly when she looked for a full-time position. And she rose to the level where she is today, the chief technology officer of Williams College, a prestigious liberal arts institution in the US. Now, it's not as though she's changing generations like Malala, but what she's doing is she's going to work each day. She's making sure systems work. She's putting more systems in place. She's allowing the faculty to teach, to research, the young students to expand their skill set every day, making a difference in her community. Sandy is another interesting case where she was faced with a real dilemma. She graduated law school at the top of her class and decided that she wanted to practice at a prestigious firm but couldn't get a job. She was rejected from the specific kind of job she wanted about 40 times. So at that point, she decided that she was going to build her skills in that area she was going to do an occasional job. She opened up a little law practice 
where she was able to keep things going. She volunteered grading bar exams, which gave her a whole new set of insight into how people thought about the law, the precedents, the application of those precedents. And, and what she was able to do over time was build a network, build skills, build expertise, so that at the age of 40, she was then asked to fill a seat that was vacated in the Arizona State Senate, making a difference at a time in the US when you could make a difference working in state legislatures. Now, of course, she's a little different case because most of us don't think of her as Sandy. We think of her as Sandra Day O'Connor, who went on to greatness as the first woman Supreme Court justice. But it doesn't take that level of achievement to make a difference in the lives of people around you. The real question is whether we're able to see our mold. Oftentimes, it's right in front of us. I recall the time when I was 42, as a practicing cardiologist, came back to my office to go through my mail, pick up the regular, regularly uh, delivered cardiology journal. I'd read hundreds and hundreds of journals, thousands and thousands of studies, and leafed through this one, and a graph caught my eye. I wasn't really sure what it was, but it just didn't feel right. I put it aside because I needed to go to my clinic to see patients. I came back at the end of the day, I looked at it, and I realized that that graph suggested to me that a drug that had recently been launched in the US, considered a blockbuster, which means it was projected to sell a billion dollars a year, didn't really seem to offer any advantage. The text in the paper said, this is great. The graph to me said, this is a problem. At that point, I had to decide how to act. It wasn't just the manufacturer who was excited, it was the cardiology community, it was the author of the paper. But it was my mold. It was a moment when I realized something was different based on my experience, and I needed to pursue it, I needed to act upon it. We were able to publish a paper about it that led to the drug's use plummeting, it really had no place. That was end, ended up being proven. It saved the healthcare system billions of dollars, enabled the physicians to focus on medicines that actually made a difference. It wasn't always comfortable. It wasn't always easy. But when you see your mold, there's that gut feeling that you know it, and you know you need to pursue it. And when you do, it's not just the effect on the community. There's also a personal benefit. For me, even just that first day, I realized that my confidence in my assessment, my confidence in my experience, my ability to see the potential opportunities, see the possibilities and understand that they're worth pursuing, were clearly evident. It led me to work at the FDA. It led me to my current role, which includes a job working for DARPA, which for anybody in a technology or biotechnology field is a dream job and really enabled me to have an impact on people around me. My challenge to you is that when you go back to your home, to your office, to your community, that you look for your mold. Your mold is there. It's time for you to notice it and time for you to act. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.